And um, what we're doing now is we're doing a, it's a, it's a four part topical series it's called. And uh, it's called Fusion Future. Let's see if we've got that up there. Oh, I guess I should turn that on. There it is, Fusion Future. And what this series is all about is, it's about who you and I want to be in the future, and we want to make sure that we're doing those things now. And even more so, it's about this youth group and this youth ministry and what we want this youth ministry to be, uh, the things that we are aiming for, the goals that we have, so to speak. Um, the first week, a couple of weeks ago when we first started, it was about prayer. It's all about prayer. We want to be a praying youth group, and that's an area that we need to work on more as a youth ministry. Uh, all of us can work on that individually, pray more, uh, but as a youth group, we need to have more prayer nights and those types of things. So uh, that's something that we need, to, we need to aim for. Okay, remember that prayer is counting on the resources of God. Okay, and then the next section was we, we went from prayer to proclamation, and proclamation actually has two parts. We covered the first part last week, and that was proclaiming God. We're a youth group, a youth ministry that wants to proclaim God through worship. That's why we just had worship. It actually was not a little mini concert for you. It actually was for you to be engaged in that, for you to follow along. They come up. They're the worship leaders. And then those of us that are sitting out would be the worship followers. Okay? And uh, so, so as they're leading worship, we want to follow. So we proclaim God through, the, through, through worship. And now tonight what we'll look at is uh, we're proclaiming God through the word of God, through his own word. Um, there is a question that, that uh, comes up every once in a while that's presented to me as the youth pastor. And that is, why do we not play more games? I have actually apologized to some of you that, uh, we, don't, that we don't play more games. I apologize, but I'm actually not sorry. Um, I do like playing games. I'm not that fun, but I do like playing games every once in a while. But why do we not spend more time uh, playing games? You may have friends that belong to other youth groups, and they always have games. And last week, we had this crazy game, and, you know, guacamole came out of my nose or whatever. You know, all the different, all the different wild youth group games that have happened over the ages, you know, ever since there's been youth group, there's been all these crazy games. Why do we not spend more time doing that, and why do we always seem to focus on God's Word? It's on Wednesday nights, it's on Sunday mornings. Uh, if we have events, uh, then we have Bible studies during the event. You know, sometimes it's, sometimes it's a 10-minute, 15-minute Devo during the event. Why do we do that? Why do we spend so much time? So we're going to answer a few questions tonight about, uh, in, in regards to that. Let's see. Uh, what we've got is, here's the, the three main divisions that we're looking at over the next, uh, well, we started with prayer. We're in proclamation, which is a two-part series. And then in a few weeks, we'll get to the last one, which is practice, okay? Uh, we, we proclaim God through the worship of God. So that's what we just did. So we're real careful. Matt is real careful to choose songs that he's going to use to lead all of us in worship. He's careful to, to pay attention to the lyrics. That's a big deal to us. It's a big deal to him, and that's a good thing. And it was a big deal to him before I ever got here, okay? But it's a good thing. We, we're, we're careful about what it is that we're giving you, even in the lyrics of a song. But we, that's what we saw last week. Now tonight we'll look at proclamation through the word of God, proclaiming God through the word. Now what is the word of God? Who can give me the simplest answer right now? What, what, what is the word of God? What is it? It's the Bible, right? It's the Bible. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me, right? It's the Bible. Now, what exactly is the Bible? I mean, all of us, you know, all of us have Bibles. When you come in, if you do not have a Bible, then we, we make sure that we offer you one because we want you to be able to follow along, see what Pastor Chris is teaching, you know, what he said or the verse that he mentioned. Is that really what it says? Is that really what it is? So we want you to be like in the Bible, there was, there was a group of people called the Bereans, and uh, the, the word of God was presented to them, and they studied to make sure that, that what Paul was saying actually was what the word of God said. So what is the word of God? I'm going to be throwing out. So this is where it gets different for all of us, because normally I would be in a passage or a chapter, and we would just work our way through that one section. Well, this time I'm going, to, I'm going to be going through several different verses. So if you're a note taker and you want to just maybe write down the, what's called the address you can write that down, look it up later. Um, you can try to try to follow along with me as I go through them if you want. Flip through real quickly. But 
let's talk about the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, so when we talk about the Word of God, now this is a this is a topical study, meaning uh, there there's no way we're going to cover everything there is to know about the Word of God. I'm giving you some basics, so that we've got the basics down, and you and I, as Fusion Youth Ministry, know, we can head in the same direction together. Okay? What do we believe about the Word of God? Well, 2 Timothy 3.16, we believe this, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So what do we know about the Word of God? Number one, it is God's inspired Word. Now, we're going to talk about it being infallible in just a moment, but it is God that inspired it. Again, let me read it for you. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Over in 2 Peter 2, 121 it says for prophecy never came by the will of man but holy men of god spoke as they were moved by the holy spirit the the point in those verses is that it is it's god that directed and motivated and authored the bible that you have now one of the big questions is always, well, uh, the Bible uh, has um, some discrepancies in it. Um, the, you know, there, there are mistakes in it, and it makes sense because uh, people, human beings, they were the ones that wrote it. So obviously there would be mistakes. Well, we do not believe that here. We believe that the Word of God is infallible and it, that it's perfect. There, there are no errors. Now, why or how in the world could we ever believe that? Well, because of these verses, because of what it says, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, that it was God that it was directing the authors. Yes, Dr. Luke or uh, Paul, or at least Paul's companions, you know, were actually writing down these words. Yes, human beings were writing these things down. But it was God that was inspiring them or motivating them or moving them to write the things that they wrote. They didn't just dream up those things on their own. It was inspired by God. It was God motivated. God was moving through those individuals. So that's how a person could actually write the actual words down on a scroll or a piece of paper or parchment or whatever, and it still be infallible. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Peter 1.21, for prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it is God's inspired word. It is also God's infallible word. Now there are a few things I'm going to throw out right now. It's some, some proofs that we have for the scriptures that are, are sitting on your lap right now. How, how can we be sure? I'm going to throw out a few things. I'm going to take some notes again, look this up later, you can do that, or we can talk about it more later. But how about fulfilled prophecy? In the Bible, there are prophecies that have been fulfilled literally. And there are more yet to be fulfilled, but the Bible is 100% accurate as far as the prophecies that it has given and, and been fulfilled. Yes, we're still waiting on more to be fulfilled. We have no doubt that those will be fulfilled literally. So fulfilled prophecy. How about archaeological evidence? The things in the Bible, the places in the Bible. So many of those things in those different places have been found. There are other religious books that claim to be God's word, and, and yet oftentimes we'll find that there is no archaeological evidence for them. Where, where you, know, you mentioned a city here, but there's no proof that that city ever existed. However, with the Bible, there's archaeological evidence going on all of the time. I don't know if you knew that or not, uh, but there's, there are always archaeological digs. There's, there's always proof um, from archaeology that what the Bible claims to be or what it says is true. How about internal consistency? I love this. I love this internal consistency, meaning that all of the books of the Bible, that they all are unified. That none of them is, is out of place. None of them are just there randomly or by accident. Uh, none of them contradicts one another. 
Uh, I used to, uh, one of the, my, my favorite things that I, that I ever did as far as classes or studies uh, was uh, several years ago, um, I, would, I would give the students that I was teaching, I would give them apparent contradictions in the Bible. Well, why does it say that he's going into Jericho right here, but over here it says that he's coming out of Jericho? What is up with that? And then I would break them up into groups, and they would go try to dig in and try to find the answers. You know that, that every week I would come in with these apparent contradictions? You know that every week we found answers to those apparent contradictions? Nowadays, it's pretty simple. It's, 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 it's as simple as getting on Google and saying, hey, the Bible, you know, there's this contradiction in the Bible. What's the answer? And somebody has asked that same question, and many others have found answers to those. There are no contradictions. There may be apparent contradictions, but there are no contradictions. There are answers for all of them. Internal consistency. The Bible, the, Bi the books of the Bible all um, uh, are, are working with uh, the, the, the purpose of, of promoting Jesus Christ. Extra biblical writings. That means, you're like, what's, what's extra biblical writing? What does that mean? Um, that means writings that are not in the Bible, writings, uh, other writings. Uh, one of the famous um, historians is Josephus. Anybody ever heard of that guy named Josephus? Okay, some of you have. Good, several of you have. So writings from historians or other people or other places that, that coincide with what the Bible says. Scientific accuracy. When it's tested by science, when the things in there that are scientific are tested, they've been found to be true. How about manuscript evidence? Lots and lots of manuscript evidence for the Bible and for uh, uh, the Bible being consistent. Okay? Now, let's move on to our next one. So God's, God's inspired word. It's also God's infallible word. Here's our second question. Why is it important? Okay, so we understand it was motivated by God. It was authored by God. So why is it important? Well, number one, God reveals himself through his word. You can do this. You can turn with me here to Genesis chapter 1. Now, there are lots of different places that I can go to to, to, uh, to give you an example. But let's, let's look at Genesis chapter 1 together. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Who can read verses 1 and 2 for me? Somebody, right here. Abigail. Oh. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness hovered in deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Okay, very good. Stop there for just a moment. Uh, we get this idea the earth was without form, and it was void and empty, and there wasn't much going on. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then in verse 3, what does verse 3 say? Somebody else read for me. What does verse 3 say, Mama? And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Thank you very much. So how does God reveal himself in that situation? He speaks light into existence. Notice that it's through his word. He speaks it speaks it into existence. Now, at this point, there were no people for him to reveal himself to. He's going to do that a little bit later. We'll get to it in just a moment. But it's, it's, that's how God revealed himself, through his word. Stay in Genesis 1. I'm going to mention John 5.39. Again, if you're taking notes, you want to write that down. John 5.39. Jesus said this, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And then he goes on to say about the scriptures, and these are they which testify of me. So we have God being revealed in the scriptures, God the Father, we have God the Son being revealed in the scriptures. So it is how God reveals himself. Now, this is huge. The question is, why is it important? Well, for starters, I need for God to reveal himself to me. See, I cannot go out on my own and just find God somewhere. Uh, I can't just go walking through the woods and expect that he's out there living in some log cabin or something. God must reveal himself to me, and the way that he's chosen to do that is through his word. Now, you're still in Genesis 1, right? Yes? No? Yeah? With me? Okay. Good, because we're going to see that's how God reveals his will. Again, we're not asking every single question. We're getting some basic answers here. Why is it important? God reveals himself. Secondly, God reveals his will. You're in Genesis 1. Who can read verse 27 for me? Somebody, yes, John. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Jonathan. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. 
Okay, read verse 28 for me also, please. Okay. Um, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Excellent, John. Thank you very much. So, what were Adam and Eve supposed to do? After they were created, what were they supposed to do? Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. How do we know that? How do we know? Because why? The Bible tells us. The Bible does tell us. Now, in, in Genesis chapter 1, who's telling them that? Somebody. Help me out. Who is it? God. Yes, Martin. It's God. Easy, right? Then, in verse 28, then God blessed them and God said to them. Whatever it is, he's, he tells them to be fruitful and multiply. He tells them to fill the earth and subdue it have dominion over the fish of the sea. He tells them all of these things. You see, what he's doing is he's created Adam and Eve, and he reveals himself and his will to them by speaking to them. It's through his word. That's how he chose to communicate. So we have God's word here in front of us. That is how God chooses to reveal himself that is how God chooses to reveal his will. Now, let me say something here. It's a big deal. This is a huge deal. It's a, the, the Bible that you have is a huge deal. In fact, we would say it's the biggest deal. Here's why. If, if we say, that, now this is the primary way that God chooses to communicate to you and I. Can God speak to us outside of the Bible? Sure he can. Yes, he can. But in those times when I'm questioning, was, did God speak to me, or was that just me, or what was it, or was that, was that just, I mean, it sounded a lot like my mom, maybe it was just my mom, you know, who was, who was speaking to me, what I can do is I can always go back to the word of God and say, what I heard, what I think God was saying to me, let me go back to his word and check what I heard there. You see, if the Bible is not really that important, well, you know, God spoke to us through his Bible, but, you know, it's not really that big a deal, you know, just kind of toss that aside and, you know, just listen for God's voice in the wind or, you know, in the whispers or, you know, in the thunder or, you know, just wherever, out in nature, or just listen to your friends or watch some MTV and maybe God will speak to you through that. See, the problem with that is when we, when we toss out the Bible, when we toss out God's primary way of communicating with us, then we have no guide. We've got no ruler. Then we've got a, 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 a then, then we, we're, we have the freedom to just make things up as they go. So we always have the word of God to go back to and say, okay, what I'm hearing, what, what, I, what I think I'm hearing, or, you know, I've been praying about this and I, I think this is what's happening. I can always go back to the word of God. Why? Because the word of God reveals God himself. And secondly, it reveals his will. Would you like to know God's will for your life? Yes. A good place to get that is in his word. Now, I am looking at a room full of beautiful young people. And I know, I know because I've talked with you about this before, that you should be seeking God, asking God what his will is for your life. Now, we go through the Bible and we get, you know, the kind of a, a general idea of, of what his will is. You know, we, we're to be obedient to him. We're to worship him. We, we know that those things are his will. But many of you are looking for God's specific will for your life. What does God want me to do? College is coming up. You know, does God want me to go to college? Or maybe he's going to call me into ministry. Or maybe he wants me to just, you know, go do this other thing. You, you know, go on a mission trip or whatever it might be. Well, a good place to start is God's word with the Bible. And maybe you're in a prayer meeting. Maybe you're out somewhere. Maybe you're talking to grandma, whatever it might be. And maybe somebody says something to you and you think, man, that, you know, was, was that God using that person to speak to me? Well, what you want to do is you want to get back home, open that Bible, and say, okay, what they told me, does it match up with what Scripture says? Because in the Word of God, the reason that it's important is because God not only reveals himself, but reveals his will. Okay? Now, here's the next question. Here's the next question. What do I do with it? What do I do with it? Where's our question at? Come on. Hoop. Shake that thing a little bit. 
Right there it is. Number one, there it is. Revere it. Okay. Here's the next question. What do I do with it? Now that I know uh, the, the, the word of God is what we consider, that's, that's our Bible that's sitting on your lap. I heard earlier that um, peop, the, the authors, the people that wrote it, were motivated by God, that God was, was motiv motivating them, moving them, and, 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 and having them, uh, he was orchestrating what they were writing down. Okay, so I know it's God's word. I know why it's important, because God uh, reveals himself through it, and God reveals his will through it. So what about me now? What should I do with it? Well, as it says here, revere it. If you, again, if you want to try and turn with me and, and keep up, I'm going to be hitting a couple different verses here. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 5. Nehemiah 8, 5. If you're, if you're not quick enough, just lock that in your brain or write it down, and you can look at it later. Nehemiah chapter 8, one of my all-time favorite books in the Bible. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 5. What should I do with God's word? I should revere it. I should reverence it. In Nehemiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. So right in there, it's like, Nehemiah, Nehemiah, is that even in the Bible? <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 5 says, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. So at that time, just to give you a little bit of context, in Nehemiah's time, when that was written, um, the wall around Jerusalem had been rebuilt. And then Nehemiah, who had who had uh, uh, he oversaw the rebuilding of the wall? He then handed the rest of the city over to Ezra and said, "Okay, Ezra, now you know the 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 wall has been rebuilt. Now these people need a spiritual revival." And so Ezra, the scribe, one of the the religious leaders, he says, "Okay." And what he does is he goes to the book of the law. He opens up God's word. And as he shows up, they had actually built a platform, and that's why uh, Ezra was standing up above everybody. And as he gets up there, he opens up the scrolls. It wouldn't have been, it probably was, was not a book that you and I would open up, but probably scrolls. But as he opens it up, everybody in the crowd who had been sitting and waiting, evidently, they all stood up, just like Abigail and Momo did. They heard the word of God, and they stood up like, oh, yes, the word of God. Love it so much, we're leaving. <laughs> they heard the word of God, or saw, they, they hadn't even heard it yet. It, it was opened, and they stood up to reverence it. Sometimes people would hear the word of God and fall to their knees. Um, you know, you think about Moses, you think about some of those guys that God spoke to, and they hit their face. In this case, the word of God, as it was opened up on a scroll or, you know, some kind of book, the people all stood up. They revered it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, what the writer of Hebrews was telling us there is that the scriptures, the word of God, are sharp enough to cut to the heart of an individual, spiritually. We should revere it. Now, the question for us, for fusion, let's just get real practical right now, on a Wednesday night, do we revere it? Now, I don't want you to answer out loud, but I want you to ask yourself that question. Ask yourself that question right now. Do I, do I revere the word of God? Do I reverence the word of God? Do I respect the word of God? Is it something that I have a healthy fear of? When the word is being taught, are we, or, or if I'm asking myself this question, when the word is being taught, when Pastor Chris is teaching, or Zach, or whoever might be teaching, if they're, if they're teaching, if, the if, if God's word is being taught, am I paying attention? Am I listening? Am I, am I distracting the individual next to me? When the word of God is taught, 
How important is it to me on a Wednesday night? Is it, is it important enough that, that you know what, hey, uh, I like to goof off, I like to mess around, I like to hang out with my friends, but once the, once the worship starts, once the Bible study starts, listen, I need you to just leave me alone, okay? Just, anybody got a friend like that? They're just like, hey, I don't want to talk to you until this is over, yeah? Do we revere it? Are we a youth ministry that reveres the word of God? Is it powerful? Is it living? Is it sharp? What else should I do with it? I need to revere it. Here's the other thing. Makes, makes perfect sense. I should read it. Yeah. Yeah, I should read it. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In other words, my faith is going to increase as I hear the word of God. As I get the word of God into me, as I read the word of God. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, God told Joshua, he's, he's taking over for Moses. Moses is now gone, he's off the scene. Joshua is, is, is taking lead of the children of Israel. And he, he tells Joshua this in chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. And he says this, but you shall meditate. A lot of us didn't know that was a Christian thing, to meditate. We're oftentimes, uh, we hear meditation and we associate that with uh, Eastern religions, with mysticism. Trying to reach nirvana by meditation. But what he means here is that we are to concentrate on it. We're to read the word of God and, and, and keep it fresh in our hearts and in our minds throughout the day. He says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate in it day and night. In other words, Joshua, keep the book of law. Keep, keep the word of God fresh. Just, just always be reading it. Why would he want Joshua to read it all of the time? Because God reveals himself through it, and he reveals his will through it. Okay? But you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So Joshua, keep reading the word of God, because when you read the word of God, you will be successful. Now keep in mind, be careful. I say successful, we think, oh, first thing we think, piles of money, fame, fortune, popularity. That's not what he meant. He meant you keep reading the word of God and you will continue, you'll, you'll learn about God and about his will and you will continue to be obedient to him. That's success. Living a life that pleases God. Whether I'm rich and famous or whether I'm flipping Krabby Patties. Whatever it might be, it's, it's my obedience to the Lord that is success. So what he's saying to Joshua is you got to stay in the word, Joshua. Don't leave the word of God. I need to, I need to uh, revere it. I need to read it. What is the last thing? The last thing is to, come on, there it is. Repeat it. Repeat it. Mark 16.5. Again, lots of different places we can go. Some of you are feverishly flipping through those pages. That's good. Mark 16.5. Mark 16, 5. I should revere it. I should read it. I should repeat it. Hmm, what's that mean? Mark 16, 15 says this. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now this was actually Jesus talking to his disciples. Jesus is about to leave. He's, he's telling his disciples, listen, this is what I want you to do. This, you're going to carry on the work. This is what is called the, what we call the Great Commission. They were commissioned to do something. What was it? We might think, well, Jesus is sending his disciples. He probably wants them to go perform a bunch of miracles, heal some people, raise the dead. And certainly, some of that took place. Much of that took place. But I want you to know, or see, from Jesus himself, what was the first thing, what was the main thing, Mark 16, 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every 
creature. Now, he was referring to the gospel message. Go tell everybody about Jesus. Jesus is saying, go tell everybody about me. Go on, go. But how was that to take place? It was to take place through the preaching. It was to take place through the repeating of what they knew. They had been with Jesus for about three years. And Jesus is saying to them, listen, what I've been telling you for the last few years, take that and go tell everybody else. Interesting. It's very interesting that Jesus tells them to go preach the gospel to every creature. Why didn't he say, what every creature needs is a stimulus check. Just go make sure everybody's got a stimulus check. If you give everybody a stimulus check, they'll all be, you know, they'll all have all of their, their problems, you know, they'll all be satisfied. Because that's not going to solve our problems. In fact, for many, it's going to create more problems. $1,400 is 1,400 problems. Okay? He didn't say, I want you to pursue social justice. That's strange. This is Jesus. He loved people. It was all about loving people, serving God, serving people. And yet he doesn't tell them, I want you to go into all the world and I want you to fight for social justice. What does he say? He says, go into all the world and, and, and preach the gospel. What he's saying is the one thing that is going to change lives, going to save people from hell, is the preaching of God's word. Without the preaching of God's word, the miracles mean nothing. You may heal someone, you may raise someone from the dead, but if they do not understand God's truth and do not receive that, they will be healed, they will be resurrected from the dead, and they will still die, and they will go to hell. Jesus was making sure that his disciples knew the most important thing is the word of God. It's God's word. I want to repeat it. Here's the, uh, uh, the, the, the second verse to go along with that last point. 2 Timothy 4.2 says, this is Paul speaking to Timothy. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Now this again, strange. Because it is believed that Paul was about to die and that he writes this final letter to Timothy who was going to carry on the work. And Paul says to him, preach the word. Preach the word. Take God's word and preach it. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort. And then he says, with all long suffering and teaching. It's funny. There's nothing in there about miracles. There's nothing in there about money. Nothing in there about social justice. Paul says the only thing that is going to affect the heart of mankind, of people, is God's word. Remember, it's powerful. Sharper than a two-edged sword. I'm going to finish with this verse again because I love that 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. I want you to see this. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, and I think it's safe to say man or woman, the person of God, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thoroughly equipped, complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. If the rapture does not happen in the next couple of years, many of you will be leaving this youth group and taking off for college. Whether it be secular college or even Christian college, private college, whatever it might be. And in that college, there will be someone there who will want to question your faith, to test your faith. Believe it or not, there are, there are professors and there are other students there whose goal it is to destroy your faith. 
And I've heard the statistics from, you know, I get lots of youth ministry stuff and info and, oh, the statistics, you know, so many young people, you know, they leave high school. You know, the high school ministry is so important because they go into college and then they, so many of them lose their faith. They walk away from the Lord. They walk away from their faith. Well, I wonder, my question is this, did those individuals that they polled in the statistics, did they ever have a faith or were they so busy playing games that their faith was never developed? I've shared this with you before. I've shared with you from my heart. Why do we, why do we not do more games and have you know, zany stuff and all the, all the craziness? Because one of these days, and some of you have already experienced crisis in your life. One of these days, a family member is going to be sick and, and come home with some diagnosis that, uh, of, of some sickness that is incurable. One of these days, a friend of yours is going to say to you, you know, I'm considering suicide. My life is just so horrible. My life is terrible, and this is what's going on. One of these days, a neighbor is going to come to you and say, this is what's happening in my family. Tragic. For many of you, you will be tested in those same ways, you personally, if you have not been yet. And the rule, we focus on the word of God in here because it is powerful. Because we want what's best for you. And that is what is best for you. Father, we...